Big news for anyone who loves the history of D-Day. Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours has just launched a brand new tour that visits the D-Day beaches and lots of other sites in rural France, and all from the comfort of a luxurious cruise on the Seine River. Now, we ran this tour in 2024, and it was a huge success. It sold out in a matter of weeks. So now we've rolled it out again for 2025. But this time, there'll be three departures in June, July, and September, giving you three times the opportunity to join us. The cruise is on board the luxurious Armadeus Diamond and begins and ends in Paris. Over eight days, you'll enjoy the history, scenery, and culture of the beautiful Seine River, But as an exclusive offering just for our passengers, you'll enjoy two full days touring the D-Day landing beaches in both the US and British sectors, plus daily seminars on board the ship that unpack the history of D-Day. And like all our tours, you'll be hosted by one of our expert historians who'll bring the story of D-Day to life. And if you've been on one of our tours before, you'll know that our historians really are the best there is. This is an exclusive cruise and places are extremely limited. Visit battlefields.com.au to book your place today. When it comes to weight loss, no two people are the same. That's why Noom builds personalized plans based on your unique psychology and biology. Take Brittany. After years of unsustainable diets, Noom helped her lose 20 pounds and keep it off. I was definitely in a yo-yo cycle for years of just losing weight, gaining weight, and it was exhausting. And Stephanie. She's a former D1 athlete who knew she couldn't out-train her diet, and she lost 38 pounds. My relationship to food before Noom was never consistent. And Evan, he can't stand salads, but he still lost 50 pounds with Noom. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. Even through the pickiness, Noom taught me that building better habits builds a healthier lifestyle. I'm not doing this to get to a number. I'm doing this to feel better. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom users compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. A Living History Production. I'm Matt McLaughlin. And I'm Pete Smith. We're battlefield historians who love nothing better than getting out and walking the ground where great battles in history took place. And now we'd like you to come with us. Every week, Battle Walks will take you to one of the great battlefields of Europe. As we walk the ground, we'll dig through the pages of history, we'll uncover the secrets of the battlefields, and most importantly, we'll tell the stories of the people who fought and died there. Welcome to Battle Walks. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Battle Walks, where we are exploring some of the great battlefields of Europe, and indeed, in future episodes around the world. I really hope you're enjoying it because we have been loving bringing you these walks through history. We've had wonderful feedback, so thank you. Please keep sending that through through the Facebook page, Twitter. You can find us on Living History or my personal account, Matt McLaughlin. And thank you for sending that feedback through because it's really great to know that people are listening and enjoying what we're doing. Joining me, as always, my partner in crime, Pete Smith. Pete, welcome back to Battle Walks. Hi, Matt. Thank you very much. Looking forward to uh, another walk. Mate, have you been enjoying the uh, the adventures we've had over the last several weeks? Oh yeah, great fun. Uh, if we can't get out literally on the ground, it's uh, it's nice to uh, to talk about it uh, and imagine that we're walking about there on the ground. I also want to add at this stage, if you're enjoying what we're doing, there's another great podcast you should tune into, which is uh, put out by Paul Reed, who's a wonderful military historian. And his podcast is called The Old Front Line, where he walks the battlefields of the First World War in France and Belgium, and Gallipoli as well. He's done a couple of episodes on. So if you're enjoying this concept of going out and walking a virtual battlefield, definitely check out The Old Front Line with Paul Reed because um, Paul really knows his stuff, doesn't he, Pete? Oh, he certainly does, yeah. He's probably number one, uh, yeah. I met Paul very early on when I arrived uh, in France. In fact, he lived in a village not very far away at that time from where I live now, and so, uh, yeah, I, I met him very early. Well, today we are heading, uh, we're sticking with the First World War, but we're heading a little bit north again. We're heading back to Belgium. I know it's a favourite for both you and me, Pete. 
And this one, it's it's this to me, Pete, is almost like a bit, you know, visiting with an old friend. We're going to do the town of Ypres in Belgium. And this is one of the most famous sites from all of the fighting in the First World War, the famous Ypres salient. And it's a really lovely town. It's going to be great to get out and actually walk through the town. The battlefields outside the town are extraordinary as well. But there's something really powerful about walking around the town that was destroyed during the war and completely rebuilt. I think it's one of the most emotive places on the whole of uh, the battlefields of the Great War. I suppose it's up there with uh, Verdun and the, uh, the the battlefield around Verdun. Um, I'm missing it so much. I mean, I haven't been for almost a year now uh, because of COVID, so it's, uh, it's extraordinary to not have been back. Um, I think one of the things that we just need to get out of the way early on is is the pronunciation of the name. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Epers, however you want. Um, very often when I'm uh, on my coach with my clients, I, I generally say to them, because they all pronounce it differently, I say, look, so long as you know where we're talking about, and I know where we're talking about, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it because there are so many variations. Part of that problem is because of the French-Flemish issue. Um, so, that, so there are actually two languages in, in use there. During the First World War, we tended to use the, the French version. So uh, Eep is actually pronounced the same in both, but it looks very, very different. I E. P-E-R is the Flemish or Dutch version. Y-P-R-E-S is the, is the French version. And that was the version that was being used during the First World War. I made a fatal error. Uh, last year, I released a documentary on YouTube called Walking the, Walking the Battlefield of Ypres. And uh, I called it by its Flemish name, Ypres, uh, throughout that documentary and uh, received a lot of feedback from people that I was getting it wrong. Interestingly, most people told me it was pronounced Ypres. Um, and I just want to say that's a beautiful British mangling of French that no French person <laughs> would understand Ypres to this town. The French pronunciation is Ypres. But um, I, because I, I walk the ground there and, and visit so often, I, I fall in the habit of going by the name the locals use, which is the Flemish name, which is Ypres. Um, but either way, we're talking about the same place. All the names are valid. Uh, and so uh, I'll probably fall into a mix of several different versions during this walk. Um, but uh, I typically refer to it as Ypres. Um, you can refer to it as Eep if you like, or anything else. But uh, And as we know, the soldiers called it Wipers because they couldn't pronounce it at all. Regardless, however you pronounce it, it's a lovely town. I think that's a good way. Wipers is always, is always good. <laughs> so, Pete, tell us about the town. Let's, let's even start before the World War I history because, obviously, I think that's something really important for us to stress as well. We are looking at these places through a very narrow framework of a traumatic period in their history. But these communities existed for centuries before the First World War came along and indeed will continue for centuries long after. So why don't you tell us about the town itself and then we can lead up to its World War I history. Well, you have to say where it is in the, the north of Belgium, um, or actually the south of Belgium, the north of France, it's right on the on the border, just over the border into Belgium. It's an area that uh, we've uh, has been fought over, well, for forever almost. So it's had a fairly traumatic life for most of its uh, its history. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it's it's I suppose when it was really, really, uh, I suppose on the up. Uh, was in the 13th century, and also the population was as high as it will uh, it will ever be at that time. Forty thousand people uh, lived in uh, in the town, and they were basically involved in in weaving and looms, and that's where where we, all the wealth came from. The wealth for building the, the enormous uh, church there, the cloth hall, which we'll talk about in a little while, the the large buildings and multiple churches, actually the cathedrals, churches. They're just everywhere within the town itself. It's a walled and fortified town, and always was. And, uh, yeah, it was a very, very wealthy trading location. Actually, oddly, it's a port because there was a canal that ran from the town out to the coast, to the North Sea. And so very much uh, integrated and part of the trading with Britain or England, uh, as it would be at various times, Britain, now England previously. And a lot of excess wool was sailed across the channel and uh, and into the canal and up to Eep to be sold to the traders there who who produced the the wool and clothing from it and the the cloth. So it's a it was a very very wealthy place. And one of the things they often say is the cloth hall, which a lot of people think is the church. When you first arrived in the town, you look at it; it's a big tower. It looks churchy, but it isn't. It's it's the cloth hall, and it's an attempt of the weavers. Really, I often think it's the weavers saying that we are as powerful as the church. We can build something that looks like a church, but in fact is is a building. It's a civic building. It's a trading centre for the trading of, of cloth. Uh, so it's uh, it was a very wealthy place in the 1300s and very much linked to to England and, and because of that trade. It's fascinating when you arrive and stand in the town today uh, and 
you're standing right in the footsteps of some wonderful photographers who took amazing photographs of the town in its destroyed state during the First World War. And as you say, that building, the Cloth Hall, the iconic building in the centre of the town, now rebuilt uh, to, uh, to its former glory, but standing on those spots. We'll, we'll get into it a little bit uh, more as we do the walk, but just being able to stand in this town that was completely destroyed and really symbolises that destruction of the First World War and indeed the rebirth, the phoenix rising from the ashes and, and, and these towns and cities being rebuilt in the years later. Correct. It is the most destroyed town of its size uh, of any of the towns of the First World War. So it was absolutely flattened. And, and that is very hard in its own right for anybody to, who, who, who has no experience and very few as would, would have experience of looking at a town that's been destroyed to stand in a place and try and explain to people that this was flattened. This place was flattened. In 1914, 1918, it was totally almost obliterated, apart from the cloth hall and a few of the bigger buildings, but almost everything else was destroyed just piles of rubble and this is really hard to get your head around when you're looking at a a town that's been recreated to such a degree that it's very hard to tell what is old and what isn't and in fact nothing is old well I have to say there's the odd fragment in the cloth hall itself but the majority of it has been rebuilt. One of the my great delights is roaming the streets of Ypres and trying to find those original stone and the original facades of of buildings that that were incorporated in the re, in the reconstruction, and you can usually spot them because they're so scarred from shell fire, but considered structurally sound enough to be reincorporated in the buildings. But as you say, very very few, really only the stonework down on street level. Occasionally you'll find uh, something that looks a bit original, but all the brickwork, all the fronts of the buildings, you know, everything is uh, is completely reconstructed in the nineteen twenties. Yeah, it's extraordinary, and it's something that takes a lot of uh, of explaining to people, uh, especially people from the, I have to say, from the Southern Hemisphere, who who are coming to these medieval cities. They may have been to Bruges, and Bruges, just a little bit further up the coast, looks very, very similar, but of course, Bruges was was not destroyed, so it's an original medieval city. Well, this feels and looks like Bruges, and so to then realise that it has been rebuilt, it's, it's, it's something to get your head, your head round. Eep's extraordinary for that because I always say when I go to the battlefields that we want to get a feeling for what it was like, but we don't want to relive that experience. I mean, we can't. Obviously, we can't go back in time and, and go through what the men went through. But I think from, a, from our human condition, we want to have an understanding, we want to have an empathy and a connection with these people who suffered through this great trauma. But we, we, there's no way we would actually want to be exposed to what they went through. It was just too horrific. And Eep is an amazing example of that, that you can stand there in the town, you can find those links with history. But you cannot, your head just cannot compute that had you been standing there 105 years earlier, you would have been in a pile of rubble. It's really quite extraordinary. Yeah, it is indeed. And and when you think back to the soldiers and men that passed through here, because that is why it is so important, and we're going to set off from the uh, from the cloth hall, but why it is so important is that everybody that, that almost... Everybody that fought on the uh, on the salient in the salient, this flat area of, of land surrounding the town, would have actually come through the town because the entrance was at one side and the exit was at the other, and so you came through the town, whether it be in the dark or the daylight, and out through the the Menin Gate uh, onto the the Menin Road and then up to the to the front line. So. It is so synonymous with, with every single soldier, wherever you came from, uh, would have at some t- stage, if you were in Belgium between 1915 and 1918, then almost certainly you would have come to weep at some stage. And let's talk about the, the salient, what a salient actually is for people who might not be familiar with that military term, because that is the reason that Ypres was so pounded. That's the reason there was so much fighting in the fields around us. Give us a run through of what a salient is and how the salient was formed around Ypres. Well, a salient is a geographic term, um, so if you use it in, in its generic term, a salient is a, a piece of land that, uh, that pushes into another piece of land. So it's normally a flat area surrounded by ridges, but it could be something else. It's something that juts out into, it could be a piece of dry land and a boggy land. Um, so it's an area uh, uh, jutting into something else. And here that's exactly what it is. It's a flattish piece of land. It's not totally flat. Uh, people get uh, confused with Flanders uh, towards French Flanders, which is very, very flat. Um, this is not totally flat. There are ripples in it and little ridges. And, and uh, so you have this flat, flattish area surrounded by a ridge. And it's not a high ridge either. We're only looking at 60 odd metres above uh, sea level that runs around it. Um, and uh, so that's what it, what it is. So the geographic term is a salient. But during the First World War and since, if you talk about the salient, then you'll be talking about this area of land that just outside the walls of Ypres uh, with the ridges. And for most of the war, the Germans are on those ridges. So that's the problem. The Germans are overlooking the town. 
So there's a really important political consideration here as well, is that the Germans tried to capture Ypres several times during the war, were never successful, but did capture land around it, which left the British line and the French line sticking out, as you say, into German territory. And that creates problems from a military perspective because it means that the Germans could fire on the Allied defenders from three sides. They're effectively surrounded except at the rear. Uh, and that obviously created a, a huge, um, just just massive destruction within that area. But the other question that always gets asked is why didn't the British and the French, why didn't they pull out? Why didn't they just pull back from Ypres, straighten their line, and then they could have taken the Germans on um, face-to-face rather than having them you know, effectively surround you? Um, and the important reason is a political consideration. Britain went to war because of the German invasion of neutral Belgium. That was the reason Britain went to war, to, to defend neutral Belgium. And the Germans successfully captured almost all of Belgium except for this tiny little corner. And Ypres was the really the last substantial town the Germans had not captured during the First World War. And so the British just felt they could not abandon the town of Ypres. They could not give up the last toehold they had in Belgium when this was the whole reason they'd gone to war. And so that was the reason they held on in spite of the fact that militarily it was probably a very poor choice to stay in that town overlooked by the Germans on three sides and effectively surrounded by them. I think the other reason uh, as well, Matt, is that the losses in 1915, uh, 1914, that winter of 1914, 1915 to the regular British army who was fighting there were were so terrible that there is also another point of honour is that the memory of those men that fought and died to try and hold the Germans on those ridges or stop them from taking those ridges to then uh, abandon the town and fall back would just not have been seen as a a good thing. So uh, there are two issues. There's the one of, uh, as you quite rightly said, of holding holding on to what's left of Belgium, and there's not a lot left of Belgium, uh, and also also the just the point of honour of so many men that died in the early uh, stages of the war that we were going to hang on to this, this town and not let the Germans have it. Well, let's explore the town because it's an extraordinary place. I should say most of the people in the town speak English as well as Flemish and some French, so it's a very welcoming town. Having a cold beer in a cafe on the, on the square in the centre of Ypres at the end of a long day on the battlefields is one of the great joys of visiting this region. It is a, just a really lovely town. As I said, it's like visiting an old friend. I love the town of Ypres. And everyone listening to this, when you make it over to the battlefields, whether you've been before, make sure you go to Ypres because it's just an extraordinary place. So let's begin in that square that I was talking about, the Grote Markt, as they call it, the Great Market, the Great Market Square in the centre of town, loomed over by the Cloth Hall. Uh, well, I find the, the Great Square fascinating. When you visit, uh, uh, I'm lucky enough because uh, I, I go there quite often with uh, the tour groups, um, to be able to go there on a on a Saturday when the market is, is taking place. And the market is a little bit more of a traditional market. So it's a lot of foodstuffs, cheeses, uh, sausages, uh, chickens, things like that. I always get people to, to stand in the middle of the market and to close their eyes and just listen. And you can hear the, the hawkers shouting and the noise and just the general bustle of the market. And you could be in a medieval market. I think it's just a fantastic place. I also like it because the, the, the square is used. It's not just a car park. Uh, it is a car park during the week for a lot of the week. But the weekends, it will turn into uh, the market. They have uh, car rallies. They have a fairground there. They even, believe it or not, do beach volleyball there in the summer. They set up a beach volleyball, import lots of sand. and uh, So it's, it's constantly being used. And I like that. I like that about open spaces, public areas that are going to be used. And so the people still use it. And I think it's very much a a European and has that feel uh, that that takes you right the way back to that medieval period. It's an important connection with that history, isn't it? Because this is the way that people came together for centuries, is that the, the, the square in the middle of the town was where they would assemble to trade goods to simply meet friends and family, to to participate in leisure activities, to have celebrations at key times of the year. The the, the, the market square in the centre of towns has always been the, the, the place the town came together. And that's been lost in a lot of a lot of the, the towns and cities of, of Europe. But uh, but in uh, this part of Belgium, it's, it's maintained very strongly. It is. So I'm just going to go back a little bit and just talk about the Cloth Hall. So the Cloth Hall was built in about 1200 is when it uh, when it was started. Um, it looks exactly as it did, but as we know, it's been it's been totally rebuilt. It now has a, a very important museum for the local area, the In Flanders Fields Museum, which is uh, definitely worthwhile having a having a look at. And even a brand new museum. Now, interestingly, I lived uh, about uh, nine, ten years ago. I lived in Ypres uh, and. Uh, 
the the building on the end of the cloth hall was still a civic building. It was where the mayor uh, hung out. Uh, now that's been turned into a museum uh, of the town. So it's the town museum telling the history of the town. So also well worth having a look at before you head out round to actually uh, to visit the battlefields or, or have a walk on the ramparts as we are going to. Uh, and that's just off the, the square. The Flanders Field Museum was redone several years ago into a bit more of a new modern interpretive centre. What, what's your feeling about that now as a museum? Because I love the old one. The old one was full of junk and emotive audiovisual presentations and I always found it real, a really emotive way to to begin your tour of the battlefields. As many people do, they begin their tour of the battlefields in Ypres. And I always thought the old museum was absolutely engaging from an emotive perspective. Uh, the new one to me feels a little bit more clinical. It probably conveys more information, but it feels a little bit more clinical to me. What's your, what's your opinion about those museums, Pete? No, I, I agree. It, it is a clinical museum. It's very clean and, uh, as you'd expect, and very all singing, all dancing now, a lot of interactive uh, uh, displays. Um, but like a lot of museums, they appear to think that less is more. Um, perhaps it is. I'm not sure. Um, so the, there are less things on display than there used to be, but it's, uh, it's, it is a superb museum and well worth going, going to look round. There is a, a slight issue that, that I find with it, and that is it, it is it has a very anti-war leaning. Now, nothing wrong with that. Um, Epe itself perceived itself as an anti-war uh, city, an anti-war town nowadays. Um, and so you do have a slight feeling of, of that, and nothing wrong with that. But I, I do think that, that you need to have a balanced view. And thankfully, we have another museum, uh, the Passchendaele Museum, uh, which is uh, which I think is a good counterbalance to the the cloth hall and the in Flanders Fields Museum. So I would recommend uh, that if you're going and you have time to go to both, then then I would suggest you have a look at both of them. One of the most extraordinary exhibits in the in Flanders Fields Museum in Ypres is uh, the the tree stump. They cut down a, a tree died, which was a centuries old tree, and they cut it down. And they've got a cross section of the of the stump of this tree showing all the rings uh, through the centuries that have have grown in the tree. Each year, another ring would appear. And the several that indicate the period of time during the First and the Second World Wars are easy to spot because the ring is charred from where this tree was burnt on the outside from the shell fire and the fighting that occurred. So now the tree survived and kept growing. But now when you look at the cross section with the rings, you see these two charred sections showing uh, in the, the point in time where the wars occurred. It's a fantastic visual representation of that history. Uh, and just a, an inter- interesting little a personal story here. Uh, in the 19, uh, late 1970s, I worked for a, a sawmill or a company importing wood uh, from Scandinavia. And we used to have to pass a lot of the wood through a metal detector before it went down to the, uh, to the sawmill. Uh, for the same reason, there was shrapnel in the wood from the the winter war in uh, in in Finland uh, against the Russians and the Germans there as well. And timber cuts in that area had to go through metal detectors before it went onto the saw because of the danger of the saw blades breaking on the shrapnel uh, embedded in the in the wood. Just extraordinary. Imagine the trees around Ypres, the story that the uh, the oldest ones could tell us about uh, about the fighting in that area. But we should talk about the building of the cloth hall as well, about the I mean the actual physical construction of this building because it's quite remarkable. So it was. Uh, I think I think from the 13th century it dates and was the centre of the cloth trade, completely destroyed during the First World War. Well, not quite completely destroyed, but certainly skeletonized. And when they rebuilt it after the war, up until the 1960s, they didn't complete it. Um, they I, they did something which I think is quite good. They left parts that were structurally sound. They left as original, so it's still got sort of headless saints on the outside and walls scarred with shell fire. And if you get up close to the cloth hall and run a hand along it, you, you you feel so connected to that history just simply because of the damage that you can still see exhibited on various parts of the building. Well, you might not be aware, actually, Matt, but uh, at this present time, the, the, at the moment, they are just starting to dismantle the tower. The whole tower is being dismantled. It's going to take them 10, 10 years, I think. I think that's that's right. 10 years to dismantle the tower in its entirety and rebuild it. And I think part of those issues are that when it was rebuilt, in in that attempt to incorporate some of the original uh, stonework, they've actually it wasn't built as secure and perhaps as as safe as it should be. So it's having to be taken down. So that work started this year, and I think is due to go on for ten years as they take the tower down and then rebuild it again. I wasn't aware of that. That's extraordinary. That will certainly change the uh, the the streetscape of 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 Eep for uh, for time to come. But it sounds like essential work. So. We're standing in the cloth uh, next to the cloth hall in the middle of the great market. Uh, where are we going to head to next, Pete? Well, we'll do a shortcut. We're going to go through uh, under the archway, um, underneath the actual uh, cloth hall itself, come out the other side, and we're heading towards St. Martin's Cathedral. So we're just going to have a quick uh, uh, detour towards St. Martin's. 
Uh, built in 1221, or perhaps should I say that's when it started. Most of these things are going to take centuries to build. I mean, these are not built in uh, in a few years. So uh, St. Martin's Cathedral, just about the same time, really, as the Cloth Hall, uh, 1221. And um, again, totally destroyed uh, during the First World War. Uh, in fact, they did try to use the cellars for a short period. Um, but on the 12th of August in 1915, a, a shell actually hit the cellars or managed to penetrate the cellars and killed 20 men within the cellars. And so they even stopped using the, the crypt, I suppose, not the cellars, the crypts of the of the cathedral. Uh, it again has been rebuilt uh, exactly as it had been. And one of the things I, I forgot to mention earlier was on the wall behind where I am actually sitting at the moment, I have a, a large print of the square looking across towards the cloth hall with St. Martin's Cathedral behind. This print was produced just before the First World War and then hand tinted. It's about 1880. And the view is identical. Uh, if you stand uh, at one corner of the square towards the, the where the, the Menin Road is, the Menin Gate, and look uh, across the square, then it's almost exactly the same, apart from one thing. St. Martin's Cathedral is not quite the same. And that's because uh, in the rebuilding of it, they decided to put a, a Gothic spire on it. They always wanted a Gothic spire, but there hadn't been quite the money to, to have the spire put on. So I always often say that it's the Germans, uh, their reparation payments for the rebuilding of uh, France and Belgium for the damage that was caused, which will allow this, this Gothic spire to be placed upon uh, St. Martin's. So St. Martin's is a, 100 metres higher than it was when it was first built in, in 1221. That's an extraordinary building and it's worth, well worth going inside. And like all these European churches, going and having a look inside, there is still some damage inside, and particularly on the columns from the original building. But lovely stained glass windows, memorials inside to the men who fought and died in the town. And the thing I always love doing as well is if you sneak around the back of St. Martin's Cathedral, there is a destroyed chapel which was not rebuilt. So there's just the shell of a chapel that was behind the cathedral, which was not rebuilt. So you can stand there as pilgrims did for centuries before you and uh, and just marvel at the destruction that the First World War brought to this corner of Belgium. But also they've just got an extraordinary thing there, which I hope they, they keep. It's fairly casual, but uh, just in the little courtyard at the back, there's much of the rubble that obviously they did not use in the reconstruction of the cathedral and they've got things as i said headless saints statues with the heads blown off you know columns reassembled from destroyed bits of rubble it's uh, it's all the pieces of the cathedral that uh, that were not put back together the uh, the gravestones in the floor where where various priests and cardinals were buried over the centuries um absolutely smashed and broken and, and sort of glued back together in some sense so again it's a it's a little grotesque museum exhibition of of just how destroyed the cathedral was at the end of the war yes it it, it, uh, it really was destroyed thankfully a lot of the actual wood carving and the the rude screens and other things that uh, inside it that were were of the same age as when it was built were actually removed um, they realized what potentially could be done to the town because we have to remember that uh, the germans as they came had been causing uh, mayhem throughout belgium uh, Louvain especially, the, the great library and buildings destroyed there and people uh, executed. So the, 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 the mayor and the people, uh, the Bergmeister of the town, got away quite a lot of the art and the treasure of the town before the Germans actually arrived and it came under such terrible shell fire. And we should say the shell fire is just truly extraordinary that the, the city will co come under. Between 10 to 20 shells every minute were falling on it at, uh, at the times when it is under heavy bombardment, which is just unbelievable. Just extraordinary. Imagine what it must have been like to be there. Of course, most of the civilians had been evacuated um, by this stage, um, but um, just just a terrible, terrible place to be. We should also mention the Germans did arrive briefly in Ypres very early in the war, didn't they? Tell us about the, 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 the only Germans that really set foot in the town during the war. Yeah, they did. It was the it was the uh, the German cavalry, the Ullahans. They they got in there very uh, very early, but uh, they didn't uh, hold it, and so we were able to uh, uh, to take the town and then to to hang on to it. Um, just as a matter of interest, just for people that are interested in dates, the actual city was emptied uh, in the May of 1915 when enforced uh, evacuation of the civilian population. So it's quite early on, May of 1915, the uh, the, the civilian population was removed from the town. And we should also mention the battles of Ypres. You know, we talk about the battles of the Ypres salient. There were, well, it depends on your, uh, some people say four, I say five great battles around the town. So give us, before we continue the walk, Pete, just give us the quick overview of the uh, of the five great battles of Ypres. Right, so so the first battle of Ypres is that autumn or winter of 1914, and that's really when the uh, the British army arrives, um, uh, fighting uh, with alongside the French and, uh, and the remnants of the Belgian army, but they're nearer to the coast, and uh, holding the Germans 
outside the town beyond the ridges and so that's what we want so we're stopping them before they can even get to the ridges and holding them um, there and in fact one of the the sites that's very relevant to the australians fighting in 1970 black watch corner up near polygon wood i think we've covered it in a previous uh, podcast uh, that's from that period from the the holding of the uh, of the ridges the black watch uh, a regiment uh, a scottish regiment holding the, the ridges there then we have the second battle of Ypres, which is the spring of 1915 and that's defensive uh, that's us uh, trying to hold the Germans as they come over these ridges and you have to say not particularly successfully, very, very heavy fighting uh, as we are forced nearer and nearer to the town. And that's where it stops and it stays there from 1915 to 1917. The fighting doesn't go away, but there's no longer, it's not seen as an important place to try and break through by either side. The, the fighting has moved across to the Somme and elsewhere. But by the September of 1917, it's our turn and this is uh, the third Battle of Ypres. Um, sometimes known as the the Passchendaele, the Battle of Passchendaele, and uh, this is us uh, attempting to force the Germans off the ridges and to break through. In fact, uh, we don't break through, but we do successfully. At enormous effort, effort by the November of nineteen seventeen, we have the Germans off the back of the ridges again. And you say, well, that's the end of it. But no, it's not, because, of course, the Germans uh, are going to come again in the spring offensive in, in 1918, um, the Georgette offensive in, in this area, and they will, um, they will break through almost right the way around uh, Ypres. They, uh, they take a very important hill that has been held by us for the whole of the war, Mont Kemmel, and we actually lose uh, uh, Mont Kemmel. Um, and so it was very, came very close to being cut off, the, the town being cut off. But again, we hold them, and you think that's the end. But no, there is one final offensive in 1918. Now, this sometimes is not called the Fifth, the fifth Battle. I tend to call it the Fifth Battle of Ypres. Um, but this is when it's our turn. It's our offensive in the September and that's the offensive which will eventually uh, take the Germans to the armistice. Uh, so five five different battles around the the city, and you have to say it's no wonder that it's uh, in the state that it is by the end of the war. Well, leaving the uh, St Martin's Cathedral, we're going to go back under that archway to the to the Cloth Hall, and now we're back on the Great Market, and we're going to head now down to the most iconic site in Ypres, the Menin Gate. So describe this walk down, Pete. And I, I think what we'll say at this stage is we will definitely do a podcast in its entirety on the Menin Gate uh, at a later stage. So we're not going to spend too much time explaining every facet of what is an extraordinary story. We'll dedicate a podcast to the Menin Gate uh, at a later time. Uh, but this will be a, sh- a short overview of just what is a, a truly remarkable memorial in Ypres, Pete. Well, it, it is. It's visible, so you can see the Menin Gate from the from the large square from the Grot Mart. So uh, it, you always are aware that it's there. It's kind of just over your shoulder all the time. And so as we walk down this road and look, it's not it's not a busy town. So you can uh, there are various times in the evening when you can walk up the middle of the street almost. You have to just keep an eye out. And certainly when the service is taking place at the Menin Gate, the road is is closed. So you can you're literally walking in the soldiers' uh, footsteps. It, it's paved, so it's uh, cobblestoned. Um, so you get that real feel. The buildings uh, each side of you are the same that would have been there prior to their destruction. So as we walk towards the Menin Gate, and of course this is where it gets a little confusing. A lot of people think that there was a gateway that looked a little bit like the Menin Gate. There wasn't. There was nothing there. It, it was known as the Gap. It was a, an opening through the fortifications because the city had been defortified on the formation of uh, of Belgium. Uh, the city was, was defortified, so there was no gateway there. So we would have, uh, if we were walking there, Prior to the Great War, we'd have been having a straight view up the Menin Road. Um, But now we've got this fantastic uh, structure in front of us, uh, the Menin Gate, which is is just superb. And so the whole time you're walking up there, you can't kind of take your your eyes off it, really, because it just draws you uh, towards it. So it was interesting that it's reflective of something we've discussed several times on the podcast, this desire from the British and Commonwealth forces, which was quite interesting and quite unique, that every man should be remembered by name. And that, that, that seems fairly obvious to us today, but it wasn't at the time. At the time, if we see what the French did, what the Germans did, they simply dug massive holes and buried all of these unknown soldiers in a big hole and then put up a plaque just saying, here lies 300 blokes that we can't identify. This idea that every man had made a sacrifice, every man killed had made a sacrifice and deserved to be remembered by name, either on a headstone or if he'd had no known grave on a memorial, that was really the genesis of these huge, grand, wonderful memorials like the Menin Gate. 
uh, and we have a drive, I suppose, a, a double whammy drive going on here. We, we have the need, and there was always felt to be a need to commemorate the enormous effort, this enormous effort to hold on to the town. Um, so there's that need. And, and Winston Churchill was driving that fairly hard. And in fact, he had suggested and newspapers picked it up that the whole city itself should be left in a ruined state. And, and that city should be the memorial. Um, that is not going to fit in with what the Belgian and the French both were thinking that they wanted it to, to be as if the Germans had never been. They want everything putting back exactly as it was. So the two ideas do not go together. And so that's that's going to be a non-starter. But the, the Menning Gate is that need to, to commemorate, and it's empire effort, to commemorate empire effort. And then there's this extra need, uh, and that is to commemorate all of the missing so that uh, every man does have, a, have an inscription. So this seemed like the ideal place to do that, to commemorate empire effort and also to carry the names of the missing on the memorial itself. I say when I'm there to people that it's a bit of an odd child, the Menning Gate, that it's half a victory arch and then half a mausoleum. It's a, it's a, so the, 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 it is an arch, like a victory arch, and we, we've seen this across Europe, that an arch is a symbol of victory. Uh, so it definitely is that. It's a symbol of victory in the salient that we won the war, but then it's covered in names of the missing. In fact, 54,000 names etched into the, the panels of the Menon Gate. It is truly because you do, it's amazing because you don't notice them as you're walking up towards the memorial. You can see the lion, the empire lion on on top, that benign kind of uh, the look of the overseer. I often think he has uh, on top of the the main gate. Uh, it's a, a beautiful structure, but the names are on the inside and on the outside. So as you're looking towards the front of it or the back of it, depending on which side you're coming towards it, you can't see the names. And so you you for, it's for a long time you think you're just looking at a memorial. It's only as you get close you realise that the panels underneath the archway and if you go to the sides, on the sides of it, uh, they are uh, engraved with, with the, these tens of thousands uh, of names. I think the person that got it right, and I don't know whether he wrote this speech himself, uh, but on the inauguration, and it was inaugurated on the 24th of July in 1927, Field Marshal Lord Plummer said, he is not missing, he is here. And I think that was just such a... A catch, a catch line, as we'd call it nowadays, that just just says it all. Really, that's exactly what this is for. It's it's so that all of those people that have no headstone, no grave to go and visit, they can come to this memorial if they're missing uh, in Belgium. For I'm going to explain this in a little while. Who this thing, who this actually, uh, who is identified on the memorial? But if they're missing effectively in the salient or in Belgium, depending on what nationality within the Commonwealth, then you can come here and uh, and find their names on the memorial. Indeed, as pilgrims did for decades after the war, and in fact, most Australians who have a family connection, it's it's always remarkable when we do a, a group tour when there's say 30 people on a coach. The number of people that have a relative uh, listed on the Menon Gate is really—it's really just extraordinary. The the numbers of people that are that are collected there together in memory. Uh, it, it is uh, it's extraordinary, and I think what's very moving is uh, the, the last post. And most people will be aware that the last post takes place at eight o'clock every single night, uh, where they blow the last post. They stop the traffic. Uh, the buglers, normally six buglers, step out into the uh, into the middle of the road. And they, they, they blow the last uh, last post. We then have a, a, a minute's uh, a silence, um, and then we have laying of wreaths, and the uh, eventually the the ode, and then the revalley at the end the end of it. And people get very emotional. It's uh, every single night there are people there, not at the moment sadly, but there are people there who cannot help but get emotional. And I remember many years ago, towards the end of my father's life, we t we took him there. He'd always wanted to go, and uh, yeah, he he, he, uh, he sobbed sobbed as did. My my mother because they both knew people who had who'd fought and survived and also they knew families who had, had, had lost their uh, their loved ones uh, and were, were commemorated on the on the gate so it's still it's a, a great draw to people and we get a lot of people now who come there for the touristic aspects of it but still a lot of people who who really feel it when they uh, when they take part in the ceremony uh, as you can every night and we've said this before that these memorials, as wonderful as they are for us today to go and visit them and have that link with history, were not built for us. They were built for the pilgrims. They were built for the families who'd lost sons uh, and the, the veterans who had fought there who wanted to come back and pay their respects to their mates. So we should always remember that when we're there, that we're completing that pilgrimage. And of course, for our Australian listeners, m most Australian families did not have the opportunity to go back and visit these graves and these memorials. It was simply too far away 
uh, back in the uh, back in the early twentieth century. So we, in 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 a very real sense, are completing this pilgrimage for the, the Australian families that didn't get to go there. But that service, the the last post, one of the most important commemorative services, probably the most important commemorative service that takes place on the Western Front, and it's free and it's every night. Just extraordinary. It it is extraordinary. I'm just going to talk about who is actually commemorated on the walls. Uh, um, as we discussed earlier, we are going to come back here and do a very specific one uh, uh, on the Maining Gate. But I think I just need to explain who is on there because for people who may gallop up and not hear another another podcast from us. Um, for the British people uh, who are commemorated, British soldiers who are commemorated on the on the wall, there it's not everybody. It's effectively if you were killed within the salient up until the 15th of August in 1917, then you are on that, that memorial. If you were killed after that, and they're missing, of course, these are all missing, their bodies are, we don't know where they are. They may be in a cemetery, but we don't know exactly where they are. Then the names of people from the August of 1917 go up to Tynecott Cemetery, and they're on a wall there that commemorates uh, them there. The pure reason for it was just too many. If we'd have put all of the British on the on the Menning Gate, then nobody else would have been able to go on there. So it was important uh, and felt to be important that... Uh, uh, everybody was involved because it is the Empire's memorial. And that's the other thing to say. This is an Empire memorial. In fact, it's the only Empire memorial for the First World War. So if you're Australian, if you're Canadian, if you're South African, if you're Indian, if you're from Newfoundland, then uh, and you're missing in Belgium, then your name will be on the uh, on the walls here. For New Zealand, there aren't any New Zealanders on the walls here because New Zealand decided to commemorate their missing on each battlefield. So they are slightly following the, the British because the British do that as well, but they are commemorating on each battlefield. So the, there are no New Zealanders. There is just a commemoration commemorating New Zealand missing on the memorial, but no names of the New Zealanders on the memorial. It's quite a, a bit of an irony for me with this, Pete, is that the all the most famous battle in the Ypres salient was Passchendaele in 1917, the, th- the third battle of Ypres otherwise known as Passchendaele, which caused the greatest destruction, the most British casualties. Those men who are missing from that famous action are not recorded on the Menin Gate. They're all recorded at Tynecott because the, the fighting took place after that, uh, that cutoff date. And the numbers at Tynecott, I think it's something like 32,000 names recorded at Tynecott, just shows the scale of the destruction. 54,000 on the Menin Gate and another 30-odd thousand at Tynecott Cemetery. Extraordinary numbers are missing. I think it's quite clever, really, in a way, because, of course, those guys who are missing uh, from that point are going to be closer uh, in, geographically to where they fell and, and were lost, are going to be closer to, to Tynecott. So I can quite understand why they had that, that timing, that cut-off date, because that's, that's when we go up towards the ridges where the Tynecott Cemetery is, and, and so they're closer to it. So it, it does make sense. It's cleverly done, in a way. Well... I think we, when we come back and do this podcast specifically about the Menengate, we'll talk a lot more about the construction, we'll talk about the names, we'll tell stories of the people that are on the memorial. But just before we leave the Menengate, Pete, we're going to go down and see uh, some uh, quite an interesting little recent addition to, uh, to the, uh, the whole display. Uh, the two lions on the plinths outside the Menengate. Tell us their story. Yeah, so this is a great little story. And uh, again, I have a, a, a little connection uh, that I can tell a little personal story. Um, many years ago, probably about seven, eight years ago now, in Australia, visiting the War Memorial, looking at the lions as, as I would uh, outside the, the entrance. And that's where they normally you'll, you'll find them as you uh, approach the memorial up the stairs and into the, uh, into the, 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 the memorial um, in Canberra. Uh, of looking at the lions and one of the uh, the staff came across to me and said oh you're obviously interested in the lions can I tell you something about them and I said well no there's no need actually I'm, I'm actually a battlefield guide and I, I was living in Ypres at that time and I said and uh, I'm, I'm pleased that these are, are are coming back in a in a few years time and she jumped about three foot in the air and said how do you know that it's supposed to be top secret um, so this is a few years before it, had, it it became common knowledge that what happened was the lions are going to be returned just temporarily uh, to Ypres uh, to be put exactly where they had been because this is where they came from they were damaged and destroyed uh, outside the uh, the gap as, as as it had been and uh, they were given to australia in 1936 um as i suppose bizarrely as a thank you i suppose almost for the for the enormous effort that had been put into uh, into saving the town uh, and it was felt uh, that, that that's where they, they should be i have to say i think uh, I think Charles Bean had had his, his eye on them for some time. He'd been collecting things. Charles Bean being the official uh, historian for Australia. 
He'd also been involved in collecting souvenirs to go back to Australia. And I think he's, he'd already had his eye on them. So 1936, they will go to Australia. And eventually, it takes until 1991. A lot of people don't realise that. But 1991 is when they are first put as a pair and become the centrepiece of the entrance to the war memorial in Canberra. So here we get to the 100 years of the of the war, 2017, the, f- the fighting at uh, Passchendaele, Third Eep, um, and it's decided, wouldn't it be nice if they returned? So a year before, they start building the plinths, and a lot of people didn't understand what these plinths, uh, brick plinths being built outside the memorial, and eventually the lines are returned, and it all becomes very obvious uh, what's gone on. Fantastic, I have to say, for that whole year while they were there because they were unveiled on Anzac Day and effectively covered over just uh, after the 11th of November, um, uh, uh, Armistice Day, the same year, and then uh, returned uh, to, to Australia. And that's when I expected the plinths to be removed. But during that period, I had mentally thought, I hadn't ever mentioned it, wouldn't it be nice if Australia actually paid for some replacement lines to be placed? I thought just how nice they would look. A few people said they should stay, and I said, no, they shouldn't. I described it as they'd been back to Belgium to recharge their batteries, and they're now heading back to Australia. And that's exactly what happened. Thankfully, it was organised that uh, stonemasons in Belgium using exactly the same stone would reproduce the originals exactly. So you have to say that uh, Ypres has has got ones that are better than the originals now because there's no damage to them and they're back exactly as they they, where they'd been. They're back on the plinths and they, they look fantastic. So an opportunity to visit the stone lions at the War Memorial in Canberra, see the originals and then the uh, the replicas outside the Menem Gate where they stood for, for centuries before the First World War. Pete, let's head up away from the Menem Gate now up onto the ramparts. And we, we haven't really mentioned the ramparts. We touched on it briefly, but the, the town back in the, I think it was probably the 17th century, was a, an outpost of the French Empire and they Vauban, the famous military architect, constructed these huge ramparts around the town, um, which by the time of the First World War were not being used, but became not being used as a defensive position but became very important in helping keep people alive in the town talk to us a little bit about the ramparts well the ramparts are part of the history of the town i mean the, the history of the town is so confusing uh, uh, if you're a layman and i've studied it quite a bit and it's still confusing so i have to say um Vauban is a French engineer and he's uh, improving the defences. Uh, let me just think about when it is. 1680s? The 1680s is when Vauban is, is, is working on the ramparts. Prior to that, it had been part of Spain, uh, the Spanish Netherlands. So this had been, uh, uh, had been uh, occupied by Spain. And in fact, the, the English came across to help the French, very odd. Uh, helped the French to retake uh, the, the area from the, the Spanish. And so in the 1680s, Vauban, a French engineer, very famous engineer, in fact, so famous that he's buried uh, in the crypt in Paris alongside Napoleon. In fact, he's on the right-hand side. As you go to see Napoleon's tomb, then Vauban is buried in, in there with him. And so very often, if we've started in Paris, I point Vauban uh, on a tour. I point uh, Vauban out to people and say he's going to become past, very much part of this story. So the fortifications uh, that he built... Excellent fortifications, uh, but eventually they will be outdated. And on the formation of Belgium um, in 1852, the memorial, the uh, sorry, the uh, the defences are removed. Uh, so the guns are taken off them. You can't remove the actual the walls, uh, these fortifications, but they are defortified in the sense that the weaponry is taken from them. And very much as they are today, they are turned into a beautiful walkway that takes you around the uh, the outskirts of the town. One of the reasons they did it is they didn't want it to be a fortified town. They didn't want it to be destroyed in warfare. I mean, it's very sad when you think about it. So 14 years after the formation of Belgium, uh, defences removed, the, the gateway is removed. It's opened up into just what becomes known as the gap. Uh, but sadly, none of this will help and eventually it will all be destroyed. Um, but it's been put back, that rebuilding process, rebuilt the ramparts as well, terrible damage to them, and uh, we, we can now follow right the way around, almost right the way around the town. They're about three quarters of the way around the town. There's a, an area at the back of the town. Um, there used to be a swamp there, uh, which meant that the fortifications there were never quite as strong as uh, as the side uh, facing towards, uh, I, su- I suppose, onwards towards uh, Germany, uh, literally, that's the side that we're looking at. Um, and uh, the other side is uh, less fortified and is, uh, is now there's no sign of the fortifications. But there is a sign of the, of the moat that ran around the town because the moat still runs right the way around the, around the town. And in fact, also the, the canal comes into the back of the town as well that led to the coast. And that is still there, just no longer 
goes right the way into the town centre, which at one time it did. So we can have a lovely, beautiful walk. In the summer, it's great because it's shaded. There are trees all over the top. And in the winter, again, the wind uh, will whistle around you, but the trees give you a little bit of, uh, of protection. And it's just a fantastic walk, no matter what time of the year, because you can look down upon the town to your right if you're walking towards the Leal Gate, which we are. And to the left, you're looking out onto what at one time would give you a view onto the battlefields. Now the town has spread and it is on the far side of the wall, on the far side of the of the moat. But we uh, but we can use our imagination as to the soldiers on top of the ramparts would have had a really good view across uh, across the battlefield. One of the most extraordinary things to do on the Western Front is go to the Menin Gate, read those names, perhaps attend the service depending on the timing. And then just go for a, a late evening stroll around the ramparts as the sun is setting. And it gets dark very late in this part of the world. It's a long way north. It gets dark very late. Go for an evening summer stroll, followed by dinner in a in one of the beautiful restaurants or cafes in the town. Just a lovely, lovely experience of visiting the Western Front. And quite unexpected, I think. People expect that they're going to be spending their time on the Western Front just strolling around farmers' fields. So this is a an unexpected yet quite delightful aspect to your visit to the Western Front. But we're going to keep walking around the ramparts. We can see the remains of the fortifications. And I think when we do the, the Men and Gate episode, we'll talk more about the ramparts and specific things in the vicinity of the Men and Gate on the ramparts. But we're going to keep strolling about a kilometre or so through the trees, along the pathways, looking out over the moat. And eventually we're going to take a bit of a right-hand turn right at the southern end of the town. And we're going to be standing on a bridge which goes above the road, and this is the Lille Gate. Pete, tell us about the Lille Gate. Yeah, the Lille Gate is, uh, again, all destroyed. It was destroyed in, in the war. It's been rebuilt, so it's another another gateway, and this is an original gateway that's been uh, been rebuilt. Um, so the, the naming of the gateways is interesting, isn't it? Uh, I always think that if you'd had a few beers, you came to the market in the medieval period and you wanted to get home and you you were towards Lille, is where your, your home was, they pointed you in the direction of the Lille Gate, and that was the road that took you to Lille. Um, the Menin Gate, uh, where we've just come from, that took you to Menin. So uh, the gateways were named as uh, for the roads that uh, where they were where they were going. So this is the uh, the road that went to Lille. So if we stand on the bridge and look up uh, the the road, the Lille Road, then we're looking towards Shrapnel Corner, one of those very dangerous spots. The the clue is always in the name Shrapnel Corner. It means it was always uh, observed by the Germans and very often under very heavy shell fire. So we're looking towards Shrapnel Corner. Uh, the gateway itself has been uh, rebuilt as it, as it was, and uh, you can go over, you can also drop down onto the road and go underneath the gateway if you wish. And because there's something I always find is very interesting uh, underneath the gateway, and that is one of the old road signs, the signs that took those original pilgrims uh, to the cemeteries and uh, to the sites that, that uh, they, could, they could visit, um, put up by the Imperial War Graves. So we now know it as the Commonwealth War Graves, but this signage is Imperial War Graves. And I think it's just nice that they've left a few of the, of the old signs because one of the things that I like to think about when I'm doing these walks, and I very often talk about them, are the pilgrims. These, these people that came in the 1920s, and, and they came in their tens of thousands in 1928, 10 years after the ending of the war, organised by the British Legion, the equivalent of the, the RSL uh, in Australia. And um, enormous numbers of people, the women dressed in black, uh, the men with black armbands on, but they're coming here to have a look where their relatives uh, had fought and in some cases died. And very often it's the men themselves. This is a big opportunity for the men to come back. And 1928 was a, a big, big time for people coming to the uh, to the, the Western Front. And it's the start of right until the Second World War where we get lots and lots of people coming. And this leads into another little nice little story. Because underneath the, the gate, there's also a little comment uh, about a, uh, a lady. Um, and she was a lady who was exploring the battlefields in the, uh, in the 1970s. Um, and she was called Rose uh, Coombs. And Rose Coombs wrote a book, and that book was called Before Endeavours Fade. And she's commemorated here, and she needs to be commemorated here. Because after the Second World War, basically the First World War and people visiting the First World War died almost absolutely stone dead. And in the 1970s, when I started to become a little interested, there were very few guidebooks or anything that would help you get to know what was what, what there was still to see on the Western Front. And Rose Coombs wrote a book called Before Endeavours Fade. And the, the ta- it's all in the title. It was actually a photo book uh, with photos and descriptions of what was here. 
And she believed, um, as did lots of others, that very soon the Commonwealth War Graves would start shutting down cemeteries because nobody was going anymore. It was a big expenditure. What was going to happen? Um, and she almost single-handedly relaunched the battlefield. And certainly it's one of my early books. 1976, her first book came out. It's in its at least its 14th edition now. Um, she died a, a few years ago now. And uh, in fact, her ashes uh, were spread here. They're spread uh, just uh, in the, a rose bush. Um, beside the Leal Gate, uh, on the way to the uh, to the cemetery, it's just on the outskirts of the, of the cemetery. So, she almost single handedly reinvented people coming to the to the Western Front. And there's a walk you can follow the Rose Coombs walk around the the town as well. So she's she's remembered here, and I think she needs to be remembered here. Um, interestingly, the 14th edition has a a photograph, a colour photograph on the front of it, and it's it links to my village because the photograph is of the memorial in my village. And actually, I took the photograph. Um, the editor stayed in in the bed and breakfast when we ran the bed and breakfast, and so it's my photograph on the uh, on the current issue of Before Endeavours Fade. So my little my little edition, uh, but it's uh, it's a super book. And if you're going to visit the battlefields for any length of time, then I would recommend Before Endeavours Fade as a as a great uh, guide, a photographic guide to the battlefields. So as you said, underneath the Lil Gate next to the road, we've got those original. Um, markers pointing out the original cemeteries they're actually not the originals i found out recently the originals were removed they always were the originals but fairly recently the originals were removed and these are replicas that have been put up i only discovered that fairly recently so replicas of the original markers but still i, I just like to say original markers because they're the you know they, they show what the, the 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 road to the cemeteries that the pilgrims were following why it's, uh, did they do that, Matt? I don't understand sometimes. I really, really don't. I, I had heard that, but I tend not to mention it because I just can't believe what was the point. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Funny enough, uh, again, I've got an original marker here. I picked one up in a, in a junk shop some, some years ago. So one of the original markers, I just think they're a beautiful piece of, uh, of the history of uh, the, the, the battlefields themselves and, uh, and, and take you directly to all of these people who visited in the 1920s, came in enormous numbers. It's an important link, and we've said this before on previous episodes, we've talked about visiting the Western Front, that to me the story of the pilgrims coming in the 1920s is just as evocative as the story of the men that they were coming to visit, their, their, their sons and brothers that were killed during the war. So it's, it's an incredible story of these pilgrims from England for the most part, uh, because obviously Australians and New Zealanders, it was too far to come, but from England for the most part coming over and, and paying their respects. Extraordinary story. But also, before we leave Lil Gate, the little door. Just inside the little gate, there's a little door in the ramparts. And for years, I knew that in the ramparts during the war, the the various command posts and headquarters and hospitals and all sorts of things were established in the ramparts because the ramparts were probably the only part of the town that was genuinely impervious to shell fire. The ramparts got very badly damaged, but there, there were little rooms inside and little casements and little gun positions that the, the Allies used to great effect for protection. And there were headquarters here. I know that Monash... General Monash was uh, had had his headquarters here for for a time. It's said that General Plumer had a headquarters here, but I don't think General Plumer, as commander, had uh, his headquarters anywhere near Ypres. It was probably way back in a, a village behind the lines. Um, but there, there there was a lot of activity that went on in these little rooms, and for for many years, as I was visiting. Um, Whenever I visited Epe, I would point out this little doorway and say, "This is one of the rooms that led to uh, that led to uh, one of the doorways that led to a room that was used within the ramparts." And it's great to see that recently, I've actually through through difficult negotiations with the town, occasionally when I go over there, I actually get the key to that door. And so, for the first time, only a year or two ago, I was able to open that door and go in and explore the rooms, and they're just extraordinary. So. A um, bit of a bonus if you come on one of the Matt McLaughlin signature tours that I lead is that I usually can finagle the key from the uh, from the town and, and actually get into those ramparts. Because Have you been in there, Peter? Have you been into that room? No, I was just going to say, I need to come with you. <laughs> I've not been in there. <laughs> But uh, it's quite extraordinary. It's it's a gun. It's a gun emplacement. So you walk into a, a, a big room, which is a gun emplacement. I went in there in the documentary that I mentioned before on uh, on that's on the YouTube channel, which is uh, Walking the Battle of Ypres. So if you see that, you'll see me going into that room. I got access for that documentary. But it's quite extraordinary, it's complicated, and quite elaborate system of rooms uh, within just behind this little doorway. And that's the same along all the ramparts. The ramparts are are absolutely riven with these uh, these little rooms and casements and, and gun emplacements. So you can see where people lived and worked during the war under some protection from shellfire. And, of course, also where the famous Wipers Times, the satirical newspaper that the soldiers released uh, about life in, uh, in Ypres during the war, the Wipers Times, they had their printing presses set up in the, in the ramparts. So it's, it's, if you can 
if it's possible to get into those rooms, it's it's really quite extraordinary. The, the Wipers Times uh, for a long time, uh, uh, I think, uh, drew people and uh, to the extent where eventually they, they produced a film called The Wipers Times as well, uh, starring Michael Palin, one of the actors within it. Uh, well worth having a look at. If you know nothing about The Wipers Times and the production of this uh, this satirical uh, newspaper, then uh, go, and, go and find the film. Uh, the Wipers Times uh, with Michael Palin, excellent. Uh, well, well worth having a look at. Well, heading past uh, Little Gate now, Pete, we're going to walk up a slight incline to uh, a beautiful cemetery, the one of my favourite cemeteries on the Western Front, the first Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery I ever visited, Ramparts Cemetery. A stunning, one of my absolute favourites. Slopes gently down this this green grass towards the moat with weeping willows, and it's just a stunning, stunning place. Tell us about the beautiful Ramparts Cemetery. Yeah, that's interesting, Matt. An interesting comment, actually, because for most people coming in from Paris or from the motorway or from wherever, really, um, you're probably going to enter the town through the Lille Gate. And as you approach the Lille Gate and you're crossing over the moat, uh, there's a bridge over the moat, then you look left and there it is. Rampart Cemetery is very visible because it is literally, the name gives it gives it away, really. It is built on the top of the ramparts. And uh, I often think it was an odd place to start burying people. It, it kind of been particularly safe at various times, not not a, a very safe place to be. But certainly, anyway, sometimes needs must, and they, they, they created from the February of 1915, they created a cemetery right on the top of the ramparts. And it is truly beautiful because you have, on one side, uh, you, you're, you're slightly over towards the uh, the the water uh, and the uh, the canal and uh, and it just it, it it's just beautiful it just is a, is a beautiful uh, sight to, to sit there quietly um and it's odd i often people think think it's odd to sit in a cemetery and just to contemplate but if you're going to contemplate it, you're going to think about the walk that you've just carried out or perhaps where you're going to be going later on you can bring a map with you and sit there or a book uh, and a lot of people do you'll find uh, it's never crowded it's you never feel like you're imposing or you're being imposed upon it's always a, a lovely place to to go to 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 sit quietly I do get some people that find it odd that people should sit in cemeteries and you do get sometimes some odd looks and people think, oh, why are they sitting there? I'm sure that there should be some rule that you're not allowed to sit there and contemplate life in a cemetery. But that's what they're there for. You know, there are often there are seats in many of these cemeteries for people to sit upon. Um, here, the seat is actually uh, around the Cross of Sacrifice, that uh, that standard in every single Commonwealth War Grave cemetery, the the cross emblazoned with the Crusader sword, then you can sit there. You can sit on there and and contemplate, or you can just sit on the lawn areas. And it's a very much a visited a visited cemetery, but like all of them, it never really feels particularly busy. There's some interesting burials in here, isn't there, Pete? I mean, there's a there's, there's a couple of hundred burials here, but there's a couple of really specific ones that are particularly interesting for uh, for our friends over on this side of the world. Tell us about some of these interesting burials. Yeah, well, I often wonder. Where were you killed if you were buried here? Because they, they don't carry uh, the dead a long way. And this is effectively, it's, it's a battlefield cemetery in the sense that people are dying close to here and being brought in. There is very little concentration of people bringing them in here. There's no medical uh, facility in, in the area. Um, so most of the people that are brought in here were killed and just brought here. So they had to be killed fairly close to be brought in here. And there's there's two little groupings that, are, that I always feel that are very moving. And one of them uh, is new or are New Zealanders. And amongst them, there are 10 Maoris uh, who were killed in a Maori Pioneer Battalion, and they were killed by a single shell all on the 31st of December in 1917. They were working on a road just outside of the, uh, the, the, the gateway there, the Lille Gate, and they were brought to the nearest cemetery and buried here, and it's, it's the, uh, the Rampart Cemetery. So there's a, a little collection, connection to New Zealand there, and very moving for people of, of Maori descent, and you very often see them uh, uh, commemorating uh, them, them there. Uh, and also, there's a little group of Australians. There are 11 Australians buried in the cemetery, but I think it's I think it's nine or ten of them. Again, were all killed in in one shell by one shell on the 29th of October. And very unfortunately, this uh, shell hit the second divisional headquarters. It literally drops into a trench, and again, this trench is just outside. It's heading towards Shrapnel Corner, and uh, and it killed a, a number of uh, of men who were serving in the uh, divisional headquarters. Interestingly, you expect to find that they're officers. They're not, because these are clerks and batmen. They are the support personnel for the officers. So it's it's sadly it's those guys that were killed. So drivers, clerks, batmen, uh, looking after the officers who are buried here as well. 
It's a really fascinating story, particularly the Maori pioneer story. We told that in greater detail in our Gallipoli Second Ridge Walk, which I think was our second or third episode of the podcast. So we talked about the Maori pioneers buried in Walker's Ridge. And I think we even mentioned that uh, some of their comrades are buried in Rampart Cemetery. So a fascinating story. Go back and listen to that episode of the podcast to hear all about the Maori pioneers as they relate to both Gallipoli and the Western Front. And what a lovely place to end our walk, Pete. I'm, I can I can imagine now the sun beating down on a summer's evening and I can almost taste the first cold beer I'm going to have in the cafe on the main square after this walk. I think we've earned it after walking a few kilometres to, uh, to this beautiful spot. But what a great spot to stand and just remember these men. And a nice connection as well. We've had the men and gate with the names of the missing and now we're standing in a battlefield cemetery uh, amongst the men who, uh, who fell and were buried here during the fighting. And so what just a lovely place to end this walk in Ypres. It's a beautiful walk, and I don't think you can do it justice, uh, even though we try very hard on these podcasts, uh, but it is a beautiful walk. The trees, the layout, the views, uh, it, it's just uh, the history. It's its a great walk. Well, once you finish this walk, stroll back up the Lille Road, uh, probably less than a kilometre, back into the main square. As I said, have that cold beer and a plate of steak and chips or a Flemish stew or the mussels that you get there in white wine are extraordinary. Great food, great beer, great people in the town of Eve. It's a lovely place. I've really enjoyed this, Pete. I can't wait to get back there back there with you and, and actually share one of those cold beers. But it's been great to walk it virtually with you today, mate. Yeah, I can't wait to get back as well. And uh, I look forward to having a beer with you there, Matt. It'll be great. Discover Hydro, the best kept secret in fitness. Hydro is the state of the art at home rower that engages 86% of your muscles, delivering the ultimate full body workout in just 20 minutes. From advanced to beginner, Hydro has over 500 classes shot worldwide and taught by Olympians and world class athletes. For a 30 day risk free trial, go to hydro.com and use code ROW450 to save $450 on a Hydro Pro Rower. That's H Y D R O W.com, code ROW450. Warm days and chilly nights and mornings means now is the perfect time to schedule a $99 heating and cooling check with the five star experts at Crop Metcalf. That's right, for just $99, a Crop Metcalf five star technician will check both your home's heating and cooling system for one low price. Call today and get peace of mind no matter what the weather is tomorrow. 1 800 Go Crop or visit CropMetcalf.com. And remember, Crop Metcalf is the one with five stars. Crop Metcalf, home of the five star technician and proud partner of the Washington Nationals. 